The Supreme Court also, over the weekend and today, released a whole new slew of orders that we have been following for some time. We've covered some of the election stuff. We've covered some of Trump's taxes stuff. We have a very good dissent on the Pennsylvania cases from Judge Thomas Gorsuch, and I think there was another judge. It was either Alito. I think it was Alito who joined in with Gorsuch. So we're going to go through those, but I wanted to show you some of what the order looks like. So this is, there was a, there was a lot of, uh, of documents that came out today, uh, one big document with a lot of stuff in it. This is what it looked like. So Monday, February 22nd, which of course is today, we have this, this order list that came out. Big, big, big document. And we clipped out a couple things that are pertinent. So number one, this is the Trump tax case. Donald Trump versus Cyrus Vance the application for a stay that was presented to Justice Breyer and referred to the court is denied. So what are we talking about there? A stay, okay? Currently, Donald Trump and his you know, the Trump organization is being investigated and they wanna get a copy of his financial statements, tax records, basically everything that's in that category of documents. And there was a request by Trump and his team to stop the order that was authorizing the accessing of those documents. So somebody else ordered that. They said, go get those things. Trump said, nope, hold on. We're applying for a stay to stop you from gathering those documents. And the Supreme Court just said, no, stay. So you can continue to move forward and request those items. This was, according to the SCOTUS blog Twitter account, they said, breaking, after four months of inaction, SCOTUS, in a one-sentence unsigned order, declined Trump's request to further postpone the enforcement of a Manhattan DA district attorney subpoena for his financial records. The order clears the way for the New York grand jury to obtain the records and review them in secret. So you see here, this is all we got on it. Not much. One sentence, little bit of a letter there. So, you know, we didn't spend much time on this thing. We'll see where, 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 where this goes. Uh, but not good news if you are Donald Trump, right? It, now there's a Manhattan district attorney that has the ability to go in, request a subpoena, get one ordered by the court, get those formal documents uh, pursuant to court order. The Supreme Court has said, nope, not, we're not getting involved. It's denied. Give them the records. So now they have to turn those over. We'll see what the DA wants to do with those. The next case that is something that we did spend a lot of time on is this, Donald Trump for president. Now you may remember, this used to say Bukvar. Remember Kathy Bukvar out of Pennsylvania. We spent a lot of time talking about her. She resigned, and so now we have this person who's in her place. It's D. Graffenreed, the Graffenreed, who's the acting secretary of Pennsylvania, secretary of state. And so if you don't remember this, this particular issue, a uh, lot, of, lot of election litigation that we covered, a lot of stuff was going on here. But out of Pennsylvania, this is one of the biggest complaints that I had in, in our, I don't know, last six months of, of doing this show every day, that the Supreme Court did not get involved and answer this question before the election. I was critical of this before the election months ago. And uh, now we're sort of getting to the culmination. Are they going to hear this case or hear this issue? Because it's, it's, it's been the same issue that's appeared in a number of different cases. But the underlying issue, getting ahead of myself here, is... There was, there was an election deadline in Pennsylvania that was on election night. The legislature settled that. Done. Pennsylvania Supreme Court, long story short, moved the election day three days back. On their own. They didn't go through the legislature to do that. They sort of heard the case, said, you're right. We got to make all of these changes because of emergency situations, emergency orders as a result of COVID-19 spreading through the country. So the Supreme Court essentially just changed things a little bit on their own. And the constitutional question here was, can the Supreme Court do that? The Constitution grants the legislature the ability, the full ability, plenary power, the sole power to conduct elections in this country. And so if the legislature said that the election day is November 3rd and the Supreme Court comes back and says, no, it's November 6th, how is that allowed? How is the Supreme Court allowed to delegate, basically take away, shift election dates around when that's the sole power of the legislative branch? Can they do that? Well, the Supreme Court is basically saying, yeah, they can do whatever the hell they want. We don't care. Here's what the order says. The motion of the constitutional attorneys for leave to file a brief is granted so they can go file a brief nobody cares about. 
The motion of the Republican Party to, to leave to file an amicus brief is also granted. That's fine. You can also go file a document that nobody cares about because the petition for a writ of certiorari is denied. Okay, we're denying, we're not going to hear that case. And so if you recall, the way that this was sort of working its way up back during the election is there were a lot of questions about whether this was acceptable, whether, whether a Supreme Court can move the dates on their own or whether that's a separation of powers issue. Okay, you don't want every branch of the government just doing all of the jobs of the other branches of the government. We've got to separate, separate but equal, co-equal branches of the government. Here, in my opinion, the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania was overstepping and sort of uh, absconding with some of the powers of the legislature. That got litigated. It went up to the Supreme Court before the election took place on November 3rd. The justices, because Amy Coney Barrett was not on the court, split four to four as to whether to hear that case before the election. Four to four means it goes back down. So the Supreme Court did not hear this case. If they would have heard this case, I think this would have solved almost uh, most of the election questions that we had prior to the election and even all, even, even most of the post-election litigation, but they didn't do that. They said, nope, we're not going to hear it. So it went back down and the lower Supreme Court ruling stood, which means that the three-day window on Pennsylvania was allowed to stay. They pushed it back three days, no problem. So now the question was in front of the court, uh, well, listen, we've got more elections coming up. 2022 is right around the corner. 2024 is right behind it. So can the state governments just sort of do whatever they want with the elections and the federal government's not going to get involved? Is that allowed or not? And the Supreme Court here today is basically saying it's allowed. Pennsylvania, their, their courts can do whatever they want. The, you know, the Georgia, they had a settlement agreement between Raffensperger and the Democratic Party. They can manipulate things. If you have an election commission, they can move dates around. They can change the rules on the margins. It's all allowed because every single case that has been challenging that has failed. And the Supreme Court today is confirming that. They are denying to hear this case. Now, let's go through the Supreme Court's ruling on this, right? This is from the majority of the court. So we can see here, Republican Party of Pennsylvania versus Veronica de Gavinfried. She's the acting secretary. She replaced Bukvar. Then we have a, a sort of a companion case also involving the Pennsylvania Democratic Party. So they consolidated these into one opinion. This was decided today, February 22nd. The motions of Donald Trump for president are dismissed as moot. Right? If you bring, bring it too soon, it is not ripe. If you bring it and you're the wrong party, you have standing. If you bring it too late, it is moot. The motions are also dismissed as moot. The motions of the election projects are granted. They can file an amicus brief. An amicus brief is a friend of the court type of brief. They can also, uh, the, the White House watch fund can also grant a brief. But the petitions for a writ of certiorari are denied. So that's all we get from the Supreme Court. Okay, that's it. Why are they not hearing this? We don't know. What we can do now is turn to the dissents. So what do the judges say about this? Now, it's, it's actually sort of a long dissent. We're not going to go through the whole thing. We've got Judge Thomas that we're going to go through, and then we're going to go to Alito and Gorsuch. A couple points here that I think are worth pointing out. So Justice Thomas starts us off, and he says, The Constitution gives to each state legislature the authority to determine the manner of the federal elections. Right. This is what I'm talking about. Article 1, Section 4. Clause 1, Article 2, Section 1, Clause 2. This is where they get the authority, the state legislatures get the, the authority from our Constitution to determine the manner of the federal elections. Yet, both before and after the 2020 election, non-legislative officials in various states took it upon themselves to set the rules instead. We covered a lot of it. As a result, we received an unusually high number of petitions and emergency applications contesting the, those changes. The petitions here present a clear example. The Pennsylvania legislature established an unambiguous deadline for receiving the mail-in ballots by 8 p.m. on Election Day. Dissatisfied, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court extended that deadline by three days. The court also ordered officials to count ballots received by the new deadline, even if there was no evidence, such as a postmark, that the ballots were mailed by election day. 
That decision to rewrite the rules seems to have affected too few ballots to change the outcome of any federal election, but that may not be the case in the future. These cases provide us with an ideal opportunity to address just what authority non-legislative officials have to set election rules and to do so well before the next election cycle. The refusal to do so is inexplicable. I could not, could not agree more. Because the judicial system is not well suited to address these kinds of questions in the short time period available immediately after an election, we ought to use available cases outside that truncated context to address these admittedly important questions. Right? He's saying, we just saw what happened. We have like two months to litigate any of this stuff. That's not enough time. Now we have this case in front of us. We can decide on it so that the next time this comes down the pike, we are prepared. But the court declined to do that. Here he says, this is Judge Thomas speaking. This is Judge Thomas, a Supreme Court judge from the United States of America, saying this. Okay, It's not Linwood on Twitter. This is a Supreme Court judge, highly recognized, highly, highly accomplished, saying this. Our refusal to do so, I'm sorry, here we have the opportunity to do so almost two years before the next federal election cycle. Our refusal to do so by hearing these cases is befuddling. There is a clear split on an issue of such great importance that both sides previously asked us to grant certiorari. And there is no dispute that the claim is sufficiently meritorious to warrant review. By voting to grant emergency relief in October, four justices made clear that they think petitioners are likely to prevail. And that was the underlying case in October, right? We, we talked about this case. And I was very mad at Judge Roberts. Despite pressing for review in October, respondents now ask us not to grant certiorari because they think the cases are moot. That argument fails. So prior to this, both sides wanted to have an answer on it. Now, though, the Democrats are saying it's moot. So they don't want an answer anymore. They just want it dismissed because it's moot. It's, it's irrelevant. Trump's not the president. Biden's the president. So what do we care? Well, the country cares because this is an important question. Can the Supreme Court just change things? Can an election commission just change things? We saw that happen around the country. Can they do that? Or does the legislature have that plenary authority? One wonders, according to Judge Thomas, one wonders what this court waits for. We failed to settle this dispute before the election and thus provide clear rules. Now we again fail to provide clear rules for future elections. The decision to leave election law hidden beneath a shroud of doubt is baffling. By doing, so, by doing nothing, we invite further confusion and erosion of voter confidence. Our fellow citizens deserve better and expect more of us. I respectfully dissent. It's a pretty good opinion there. Judge Thomas, exactly right. And it is really unfortunate because if this does happen again, and it will, of course it's going to happen again. We'll see what they do. Now we have another opinion from Alito and Gorsuch, so the two other conservative judges. I agree with Judge Thomas that we should grant review in these cases. They present an important and recurring constitutional question. Specifically, whether the elections or the electors clauses of the United States Constitution, Article 1, Section 4, Clause 1, Article 2, Section 1, Clause 2, are violated when a state court holds that a state constitutional provision overrides a state statute governing the manner in which a federal election is to be conducted. That question has divided the lower courts, and our review at this time would be great, greatly beneficial. In the cases now before us, a statute enacted in Pennsylvania unequivocally requires 8 p.m. on Election Day. Nevertheless, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court used the state constitution that elections be, quote, free and equal, Article 1, Section 5. They altered that deadline and ordered that mailed ballots be counted if received up to three days after the election. This is a Supreme Court document, okay, YouTube? Both the state and Republican Democratic parties urged us to grant review and decide this question before the 2020 election. And we talked about that, but the court, but an, uh, an evenly divided vote refused to do so. We had Thomas, Alito, Gorsuch, and Kavanaugh. They all wanted to hear the case. Roberts joined the liberals and they did not hear it. That unfortunate decision virtually ensured that this important question could not be decided before the election. And now we're dealing with it now for these reasons. The cases now before us are not moot. There is a reasonable expectation that the parties will face the same question in the future and that the question will evade future pre-election review just as it did in these cases. These cases call out for review and I respectfully dissent from the court's decision to deny certiorari. 
So that is where we're at, right? The, the Supreme Court is not hearing this issue. So what this means legally is that, yes, all of that stuff is fine. It's all good. Move things around. Do whatever you want. Supreme Court can change things. Governor's office can change things. Legislature can certainly change things because they, they, we, we know they have the power. But now the Supreme Court is refused to weigh in on whether the Supreme Court has that power, whether election settlement agreements have that power, whether they can just modify whatever the legislature put in place. Not going to touch it. So the answer is, yes, you can do whatever you want. All right. And, and guess what that means? We had three conservative judges who dissented. Where was Roberts? Where was Amy Coney Barrett? Well, we know where they are. All right couple other things on this segment. Of course, the Supreme Court rejected Trump's efforts to shield the tax laws. Okay, we already talked about that. Lastly, there was another election, litiga uh, election litigation case here called Wood versus Raffensperger. Remember that one? Saoirse Rory also denied. So, no Lynn Wood case out of Georgia either. Denied. So this basically wraps up all of the election litigation. Supreme Court denied everything across the board. And do you think anything's going to change between now and the next election? Probably not. Let's jump into some questions. We got E. Dante says, if you can change the Constitution at will, then you should do not have a binding law of the land. Even if there should a change made in election dates, if one branch can do it arbitrarily, then we don't have a constitution. Yeah, I think that's a good point, right? If you have a rule written down that you're supposed to follow and you don't follow that rule, then what the hell good is the rule? You just get rid of it, right? And that's kind of a saint. That's kind of a, a, an instruction we have here at our office, right? If somebody pa passes a policy and then nobody's enforcing the policy and everybody's just doing whatever they want willy nilly, then we just get rid of the policy because it's, it's not being enforced. I don't want a bunch of stuff lying around that just is collecting dust. Maybe our constitution should just go right into that bin of things that used to matter because they certainly don't anymore. Pinky two said, thing is the Supreme court of our land is only taking up cases for politics on their leader's side. Our Supreme court should take up constitutional cases. Our vote is freedom. Yeah. You know, this is, this is another interesting area where you can talk politics, right? Let's think about the Supreme court in terms of just self-preservation. What if they, they did start issuing all of these orders that Joe Biden and the Democrats did not like. What if they said, yeah, we're going to hear Lynn Wood's case. Yeah, we're going to hear Trump's case. Yeah, we're going to deny your taxes. We're going to deny that whole investigation and just shut that down. Well, then what happens? You've got a lot of furor. You got a lot of fervor. You got a lot of outrage from the Democrats who then st suddenly start clamoring to do what? Pack the court. So, you sort of saw this back during the FDR era, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, when he was trying to pass a lot of his new, uh, new deal bills, the Supreme Court kept striking those down. Then he started to threaten to pack the court, I think, to bring it up to like 15, something like that, big number. Add, maybe, maybe bring it up to 13. I don't know what the number is, but he wanted to pack the court back then. And guess what happened as soon as he made that threat? The Supreme Court changed their tune and they started approving a bunch of his bills, right? So the court thinks about self-preservation just like any other political body in this country does. And here, you know, it may have just been sort of a, 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 an acquiescence to the Biden administration to say, yeah, look, we're not going to be too hard on you there, Joe. So don't think about packing the court. Who knows? That's just my cynical skepticism talking. Sharon Quidney says, this stuff coming down from the Supremes is outrageous. They are saying the Constitution is irrelevant. They are letting questions regarding the election go totally unanswered. Number three, they are denying any possibility of justice. They just can't bring themselves to even appear to disenfranchise millions of unregistered illegal underage dead voters. Truth be told, they probably just don't know what they would do if Trump proved his case. So it is, you know, it, it is frustrating just from a legal perspective. I would just like to know what the answer is on that. I would just like a clear answer. I mean, they kind of gave it to us. They just said, yeah, they can do whatever they want. I don't know that that's what they intend. This may get settled later down the road because I think, I think the, the repercussions from that are just not, 
sustainable. It's not a good way to do things, right? How do you run a federal election if you got 50 states running different versions of elections? It's kind of a strange concept, but yeah, look, the Supreme Court, they, uh, I say this a lot here, their claim to power is legitimacy. They've got to stay legitimate. And if they are not seen to be legitimate, then that is a huge problem for them and for the country. And so they're trying to do that right now. They respond to political pressures just like any other body does. They're supposed not to, but they, they certainly do. Chris Wiseman says, got to love the logic before the election. No case in controversy during the election, not ripe. After the election, it's moot. Estoppels, latches, and standing. Yeah, you can basically find any reason to do anything as long as it involves Trump and election litigation. Making sure that that gets deleted. Thanks, Chris. We got Liberty or Death who says, this means that ACB, Kavanaugh, and Roberts voted the case down. Apparently, they are okay with non-legislators writing law. Fauci is the highest paid in the government. Makes more than Creepy Joe. Can he now, now write law too? Liberty, you're hot today. I, I appreciate that. May fire it up. Mm, love it. All right. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what the courts are saying, to be fair, right? Anybody can just kind of, I, I think they're saying that it's up to the states, right? They're just deferring to the states. You guys do whatever you want down there. If you want to have your Supreme Court change the rules, have them change it. If you want to just sort of pure, you know, pull sort of obscure, irrelevant statutes out of your constitution and apply that to federal election law, even though the state legislature has made clear what that looks like. And you just have this whole sort of internal debate. They're going to let it go however they want. Another one from Liberty. What is going to change is now that both parties will work very hard to out fraud each other. Very good point. So that's kind of the intended consequence. I'm sorry, the, the unintended consequence of this. So I think the Supremes are saying this is kind of federalism. You know, the federal government's going to step out of it. The state governments can go in there and conduct their elections however they want to conduct them. We're not getting involved. And so, yeah, now you just have parties on both sides just going haywire to, to just fight over the rules, change the rules to serve their ends. And that's, I don't know, that doesn't sound, that doesn't sound like a good solution to me, but I'm not on the Supreme Court. ACB is largely federalist, from my understanding, probably against the 14th Amendment, so it doesn't surprise me too much. Yeah, I think I think so is Roberts, right? And I think Kavanaugh is too. Yeah, so Roberts, Amy Coney Barrett, and uh, Kavanaugh. Aren't they all federalist society judges? You can infer what you want from that. Good, que good, good point there, Mom. So the federalist group is sort of a, you know, a libertarian-ish, pseudo-libertarian-ish group that, uh, you know, a lot of people have a lot of criticism for. We got another one from Katz59 says, what is the process for recalling Supreme Court justices? Not for refusing to do their job and just listen to the cases. So the only remedy there, because they have lifetime appointments, Katz59 is impeachment. So you'd have to go through the formal impeachment process, just like we did in, uh, what was it, a couple weeks ago with Donald Trump. Wise one says, Lynn Wood flipped the script on the court system. He used the fraud as his defense against the state bar trying to take his license. He informed every person on the board of directors of the fraud in Georgia. Now they have an ethical responsibility to investigate. Um, yeah, that I understand what you're saying there, wise one. I just don't think that's the case at all. I mean, the, the board of directors, the state bar, they're not going to investigate any of these claims. I mean, basically, I think I, I haven't been following any, any of the Wood stuff because he's deplatformed everywhere. I think he's on Telegram now. But it's it's nothing that... I don't think he's out maneuvering anybody, right? He, he's talking like he is, but he's not. Uh, I, I, the, the state bar, the state, the board of directors, they're not looking into any of this stuff. And even if they did, it's all moot. I mean, it, it is technically moot. Like even if they found that this whole thing was fraudulent, it's, there's nothing to do about that. You have to pass a constitutional amendment. You got to impeach Joe Biden. He's got to resign. You know, I mean, this, it's, Lynn and, and some of these people just, you know, continuing to promise like there's some secret trap door somewhere that's going to reverse all this stuff is not honest, in my opinion. I think they're being disingenuous. And that that uh, claim, I think, has long expired. Rebelling my way says each state should operate how their residents wish. If the representatives are taking actions they do not agree with, they need to take action to remove them. It is the people's responsibility to stay informed and let their representatives know what they want. We, the people, need to take action. Our representatives will not. 
they are probably comfortable. I think that's a pretty, pretty astute observation there, rebelling my way. Yeah, I, you know, I, I am encouraging a lot of people to act locally because you have the biggest slice of de democracy pie locally. The bigger you go, we're talking about senators and presidents and attorneys generals. Now you have a very sliver of that democracy pie. Here, you got a nice big chunk because you have less people competing with you for that pie. Want to know says, what about the case Lynn Wood filed against Roberts and Clinton? A lot of people don't think he is bluffing at all. I know a lot of people don't think that. Uh, a lot of people think that he's being sincere. I just don't, I don't see any evidence of any of it. You know, he's, he's saying a lot of things that I think he's free to say, but I don't have to take any belief in any of it because I haven't seen any evidence about any of it. I've just seen, I've seen a lot of these claims. And we actually talked about one of Wood's uh, lawsuits, I think last week. And he was actually, it was, it was a, um, it was an order to remove him as pro hoc vice from another defamation case that he was working on. So not even an, an election litigation case. He was just a, he, he was a, an attorney from out of state coming in and appearing on a case. It's called pro hoc vice. If you're not licensed in the state, you get sort of admitted in to practice on a limited basis in a particular jurisdiction. Lynn Wood is doing that. And somebody was trying to remove him from the case based on some of his prior allegations or some, some of these claims that he's making. And he doubled down in his court document and said, I still have proof. I still have evidence. And I'm saying, okay, that what, where is it? If you got it, it's probably about time to show up because you're getting, uh, you know, now attacked by the state bar and all of these things. And listen, I am a proponent of free speech. I'm not saying that he should be thrown in jail or he should be disbarred even for any of this stuff. I think he's free to say it. I, I don't agree with any of it, but I think it's, it's, he's free to say he's, he can, he can have an opinion on a lot of this stuff. And I, I and listen, I'm not sort of a, a vowing total freedom for all statements Lynn Wood has ever made. I have not seen all of his statements and I can't make a, an endorsement that is, is that big in scope. But the point here about him you know, ch challenging certain things and contesting the way that these things were working, at least in terms of the election litigation, he's got a right to pursue those claims and to make those claims and say those things. And, and the, the payback, the, the repercussion for that, I think is, getting, is, is, is stepping over the line on free speech. And that is concerning to me. We got Farmer's Daughter says, I watched Alan Dershowitz today. He pointed out that this whole tax thing with Trump is finding the crime rather than looking into a suspicious crime. What are your thoughts on that? So I agree. I think that most of these things are political prosecutions, which is why I'm not particularly interested in them. You know, you've got a lot of DAs around this country who want to make a name for themselves by prosecuting the next big person. I don't like when they do it with, with anybody, really. I don't think that the political system or the judicial system should be weaponized against people who are speaking their mind or who engaged in, in, in like in political things, right? Donald Trump is being investigated because of, of, of some tax stuff. You know, allegedly they're trying to find a rationale in order to prosecute him. But I don't think that this comes from a general sort of acknowledgement or, or some, some, you know, secret tip that Trump and his team were doing something bad in, with their finances in the Trump organization. I think that this started off as a political witch hunt right? they want to go find something that he did wrong they're going to use the justice system in order to make a political point we see the da is now doing that also out of georgia and it's just something that's you know everybody's trying to grift off of the outrage from the capitol hill riots and let me if they find something if they go through trump's financial records and they find that he was embezzling whatever then okay right maybe that was right and and we'll have to come back on here and eat crow but i just you know i i think this happens on both sides a lot of political prosecutions. I really do not like the concept of a weaponized Justice Department at all. And unfortunately, we just have a lot of that going on right now. Pinky number two, last question before we move on to the next segment is we're going to end up having more votes than we have voters for all the illegal interference on both sides. And the Supreme Court just said, OK, yeah, that's pretty that's pretty much accurate. Supreme Court just said, yeah, states run them however you want to run them. We're not getting involved. And if you're uh, an attorney general from a, one of these different, I think, 17 states who sign on, we're also not going to hear from you either. So I think the takeaway from this is that they are really carving out a massive expansion of the political question doctrine, if I can just go there. Okay, we've, we've talked about here, you know, who do you sue if you're mad about taxes? Nobody. That's a political question. The courts say you can't do that. You got to go and bring those claims in the political arena, go vote. 
go run for office, go raise some money for your preferred candidate, but you can't sue the government. And the courts now are saying, don't sue us over the election stuff either. Don't bring it up. You guys run it however you want to run it. We're hands off. It's going to be a little bit of a free for all next time. We'll see how that works out.